You need to honor God when he works in your life in the smallest and the biggest things. He will give you what you need. If you are sent out, he will give you what you need. Gideon needed the spirit of Lord upon him. God gave Aaron and I affirmation after affirmation. And then when we said yes, he continued the affirmation. You need to tell the story of God in your lives to your children and your children's children. And he gives you the privilege to your children's children. I'd like you to open up to Judges 6. We're going to be going through Judges 6 and 7. We're going to be reading God's Word, and I'll be stopping and sharing a few stories and points along the way. So let's go and let me give you some context first, though. So the context of Judges 6, and Judges starts, it's after the death of Joshua. And the Israelite people want some kind of ruler. They haven't said we want a king yet, but they want some kind of some kind of ruler. And there's a pattern that starts to evolve in the, in the Israelites. And the pattern is they, they start to drift away from God. They forget who God is. And they start sinning. And they start worshiping Baal. And they, were, they, they raise poles and everything. And life becomes really difficult for them. And then they cry out. And then God hears them. And he raises up a judge. And the judge comes and brings them back to God. And they hear the word of God and they go turn back to God and then they, the generation dies off and they forget about God. And then they cry out again as they get the, the depravity of the man. He comes in and they forget about God and then they cry out to God and then God raises them up. And that's about 400 years of these judges before the kings come along. So there's that pattern. So let's start in Judges 6. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to the Midian, to Midian seven years, and they oppressed Israel. Because of Midian, the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and the Quetamites came and attacked them. They camped against them and destroyed the produce of the land, even as far as Gaza. They left nothing for Israel to eat as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For the Midianites came with their cattle and their tents like a great swarm of locusts, and their camels were without number, and they entered the land to lay waste to it. So Israel became poverty-stricken because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord. Early in this book, if you go to Judges 2, verse 1, you'll see the promise of God, the covenant God made with Israelites. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I had promised to your fathers. I also said, I will never break my covenant with you. The Old Testament is all about that covenant. Jesus is the new covenant. And God never forsakes his people, ever. He's promised us that. And so part of my background is, um, I'm Canadian, but I'm also, my parents are Dutch immigrants. And so I grew up in um, a Reformed tradition. And in that Reformed tradition, you're very stoic. You don't emotion. So this was very different for me. And so the, the idea of dancing, like, like just, uh, I, I can't dance. I just can't, right? And so the, there's hope for me one day. But, but what was steeped in me as a real little child, from a young age, I was taught the Bible. And I was taught in Sunday school, Old, Te- Old Testament, the covenant theology over and over again, to the point I thought I was more Jewish than I was Gentile. I thought I'd resonate with the Jewish people because I had so many Old Testament stories in there. But what's really interesting for me, part of my story is, and this is very interesting, just listening to some of the stories of the pastors here and some of the African culture I picked up on, is God's faithfulness. You see, my dad uh, was raised in a home, and he was the second youngest of 14. And his, he was born in 1934. His mom left 
his father at 1936 when he was two years old. So he was raised by his older siblings. My father never was able to call his dad dad. And he run into, so he was raised during the war. And after the war, he was put in a foster home. He was put into an orphanage for a couple of years. And from the orphanage, he was put in a foster home. And the foster home, he went to another home. And the one time my father um, gave me the belt. The only time he ever gave me the belt. But I knew I deserved it because I'd been stealing money from my mom's wallet for a while. So I knew I deserved it. And so he took me into the, the back room of the house and he said, uh, he said, Andrew, I'm going to use the belt this time, but I'm going to use the leather end. I'm not going to use the buckle because my stepfather, my foster dad, used the buckle on my head and the blood hit the ceiling. Needless to say, my eyes were wide open and I was like, yep, go ahead, line it up, right? Just right here, I'll take it. Because but that was the glimpse of my father into his childhood. My father never spoke about his childhood. But I share that because my mother is the exact opposite. And what I heard about um, a lot of the African culture is absent parents. And that's, that's very much. And I'm sharing this just out of the covenantal theology, the covenant God made with his people and with us. In that my, mom, my mom's family has pastors back to the 15th century. It's documented. Every generation has a pastor in it on my mom's side of the family. My father, by if you use statistics, my father should have beaten me. My father should have beaten my mom. But he didn't. It made no sense why he didn't. But other than he married into my mom's family and he became a follower of Jesus. And Jesus changed his heart. And so there's hope, you know, when, when, we, when God gets a hold of our heart, he can change what he needs to change in our hearts. He never leaves or, or forsakes us. He always is there for us. He's faithful. So the, even if you are, you may have a burden this evening about just a plight, a wish by parents. Your true father's in heaven. Your true mother's in heaven. And just want to share that, just be assured that God has you. And he's got you in his hand. He's got a plan for your life. So let's go on and continue in God's word. And I'll tell you more about my, my story as we continue on here. So we're looking at verse 7 of chapter 6. When the, oh, sorry, verse 11. Jump ahead to uh, verse 11 here. The angel of the Lord came and he sat under the oak. That was an Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abyssalite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide from the Midianites. All right. Wheat doesn't get threshed in a wine press. It just doesn't. Gideon is afraid. He's hiding. So, you know, threshing wheat is out in the open. It's dusty. It's dirty. And everything is not in a confined space. You can, in a wine press, you can do that in a confined space. So he's, he's it's not easy for him to do this. I mean, I don't know how big the wine press, but if it was maybe like, you know, a, a, a meter circumference, maybe a meter and a half circumference, trying to thresh uh, wheat in that would be very difficult. But he was busy hiding because he was fearful of what might happen. So verse 13, Gideon said, sorry, so then 12, then the angel Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. You think that got... Gideon's attention, valiant warrior. He didn't, probably sure didn't feel like a valiant warrior. Gideon said to him, in, in, my, in my text, it has, please, my Lord. Not just please, my Lord. It's a begging, please, my Lord. If the Lord is with us, why has this all happened? And where are all his wonders that our fathers told about? Told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. He knows his Jewish history. He knows he's been told that we've come out of Egypt. He's been told about the covenant. And they're in a season, in a season of the judges where they're being oppressed. And he has to hide out of fear. The Lord turned to him in verse 14 and said to him, Go in the strength 
you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian, I am sending you. But jump ahead to 16. But I will be with you. Oh, sorry. You know, it was 15, I apologize. But he said to him, Lord, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's family. My family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's family. Principle number one tonight is God uses the weak to accomplish his will. Look at the history Gideon would have known before that. Out of the history, God called Abraham to a place where he didn't know. God called Moses. Moses was spent 40 years in training before he became, God called him to be a, a minister. He was in a position of power and authority. And then he had to flee for his life. And he was fearful of his life, for his life. Look at Joseph. Joseph was thrown in a well. He was thrown, became a servant in Egypt. Potiphar's wife tried to make moves on him. He went away. He was thrown in jail. Out of weakness, God called Joseph into his purpose. God always uses the weak to accomplish his will. It's not our will, as Pastor Ron talked about, one of the temptations. I can do this in my strength. No, he wants us. He wants, he wants our availability, not our ability. It's our availability he wants. Am I willing to pack my suitcases and say, send me God, but leave my suitcases in my bedroom, in my closet, hidden? Or am I willing to pack my suitcases and say, I will go, God, wherever you want me to go? He uses that. But in 16... The servant Lord says, but I will be with you. The Lord said to him, you will strike Midian down as if it were one man. Then he said to him, if I have found favor with you, give me a sign that you are speaking with me. Please do not leave this place until I return to you. Let me bring my gift and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. So Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from a half bushel of flour. He placed the meat in a basket, the broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. Then the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat with the unleavened bread, put it on the stone, and pour forth the broth on it. So he did that. The angel of the Lord extended the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire came up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Where have you seen this before? Where have you seen a tip of a rod hitting a rock. But instead of water this time, it's fire. Where have you seen, that back when Moses did it, where have you seen, that's, this is, you know, we see Elijah when he poured the water over things. So imagine Gideon who's fearful. The servant of the Lord saying, go do this. And boom, instant fire. Did that get his attention? Probably got his attention for a short time but not long enough. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon realized that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, oh no, Lord God, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace to you. Don't be afraid for you will not die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. It is still an Oprah of the Abdur's rights today. So in 25, he goes on, now, very night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull and the second bull, 700 years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Build a well constructed altar to the Lord your God on the top of this mound. Take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his male, seven, uh, took 10 of his male servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was too afraid of his father's family and the men of the city to do in the daytime, he did it at night. That fear continues. Okay, I'll be obedient, God, but I'll do it my way. When the men of the city got up in the morning and found Baal's altar torn down, the Asher pole was cut beside it cut down, and the second bull offered up in the altar it had been built, they said to each other, Who did this? 
After they made a thorough investigation, they said, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. Then the men of the city said to Joash, who's Gideon's dad, remember? Bring out your son. He must die because he tore down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash here stands up for his son. To all who stood beside against him, would you plead Baal's case for him? Would you save him? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If he is a god, if Baal is a god, let him plead his own case because someone tore down his altar. That day he was called Jeroboam, since Joash said, let Baal contend with him because he tore down his altar. So Gideon is fearful. Gideon's called out. And then the next thing is, all the Midianites, Amalekites, and Quinmites gathered together, crossed over the Jordan, and camped in the Jezreel Valley. In 34, the spirit of the Lord enveloped Gideon. And he blew the ram's horn, and the Bezrites rallied behind, behind him. He sent messengers through all Manasseh, who rallied behind him. He also sent messengers through Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and all, who also came to meet him. Principle number one, God uses the weak to accomplish his will. Number two, which we see in verse 34, God gives his people what they need to carry out his will. The spirit of the Lord enveloped Gideon. The spirit of God came upon him and gave him strength that God knew he needed. As that continues on, Gideon said to God, if you will, in verse 36, if you, you will deliver, deliver Israel by my hand, you said, I will put a wool fleece here on the threshing floor. If dew is on the fleece and all the ground is dry, I will know that you will deliver Israel by my strength, as you said. And that is what happened. When he got up early in the morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung the dew out of it, filling a bowl with water. Gideon then said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me speak one more time. Please allow me to make one more test with the fleece. Let it remain dry and the dew be all over the ground. That night, God did as Gideon requested, only the fleece was dry and the dew was all over the ground. This leads me to my story, my call to ministry. You see, I'd come out of the corporate world. I was in sales. I thought I was all that back then, making big bucks. I was doing okay for myself. But God got along in my heart when I did a major transaction, and I knew I would die a slow internal death if I was going to stay in this industry. And by God's grace, I went home to my wife. I said, good news and bad news. So what's the good news? I said, good news. I sold a major building. She said, great. What's the bad news? I, said, I can't be doing it anymore. My wife looked at me, and she goes, okay, what are we going to do? Now, she was pregnant with our first child at this point. And so I went back to school. And I was thinking youth ministry, because I've been involved in youth ministry my whole life. And then as I was going through youth ministry, uh, as I moved into my MDiv, because I'd done a few, a couple, half a degree here, half a degree there, I, I really goofed around. It's, it's not good when you, you know, when your kids look at you and say, Dad, you really goofed around for like eight years, didn't you? Said, mm, yeah, I did. And by God's grace, your mother stayed with me. Now, <laughs> but I had half a degree here, half an, half an engineering degree, half a marketing degree, and so when you're trying to get a Master of Divinity, guess what? I'd go back to school in the beginning. That doesn't, no credits get transferred for that. So I ended up realizing it's not youth ministry. It's working with men. And I became a marriage family therapist. Fast forward to the year 2001. And being in sales, I network. And trying to find resources, clients. And I ended up uh, just connecting with pastors in the area. And there's a new church in town and it's called The Sanctuary, and a guy named Jeff Christofferson. So I rang him up and uh, gave him a call, and we met. And we just started connecting. We just, you know, sometimes when you meet someone, and you just, something's odd about that. It's different. There's something really special here. I don't know what it is, but as both Jeff and I said this. And so we agreed to go our ways for a couple weeks, and we met a couple weeks later. And that got amped up to the next level. And so I'm all excited about this possibility. And Jeff being the, the church planner, the quintessential church planner, said, 
I got a plan for your life and it's come to join my church as a family pastor and you have to raise all your money for yourself. Go. Now, you have to understand, I was in a church that was pretty traditional that they would, how they would call a pastor is the elders of the church would get together, they would pray, we need this pastor. Someone would write a job description and they would have, so, okay, can we afford it in the budget? They pass it in next year's budget and then that's all, everything's in place and then we go looking for a pastor. I go home to my wife and I go, this is what's going on. My wife's going, well, I love you, sweetie. I'm glad you're excited. But I'm about to give birth to our third child here. Leave me alone. I'm just, I'm too busy. Just leave me alone. So I just, I just said, okay, I'm going to start praying quietly by myself. This is where Gideon's story comes in. So as I'm praying, I said, okay, God, I'm going to pull a Gideon on you. You got to make the dew, the fleece wet. So, now understand where I live. It's a suburb of Toronto. Toronto, Greater Toronto area is about 7 million. It's kind of like Chicago. With Chicago, Toronto, very, very large geographically. Uh, the, the city I live in is about, uh, it just bleeds right into one or the other. So you can't tell when you go from one city to the next. And so I'm just going through life and you know, praying this prayer. And all of a sudden, I walk into a coffee shop. And who's sitting there? Jeff Christofferson. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. What little, little make anything of it. Okay, that's one time. A couple days later, walking through a restaurant, there's Jeff sitting at the table. Hi, Jeff. This is strange. Okay. Still saying, praying my prayer. I don't have enough faith yet. Okay. I'm praying my prayer. On the same day, I run into Jeff somewhere else again. I forget where it was, but I run into him again. And then, okay, this is weird. God's doing something. And then, Later that afternoon, I'm trying to be a good husband. I'm going grocery shopping for my wife. And Jeff's trying to be a good husband and trying to go grocery shop for his wife also. And there we stand in the produce aisle of the supermarket going, I think God's up to something. And I said, have you ever read this book called Experiencing God? And Jeff just kind of smiles. He goes, yeah. He didn't tell me that he was with Henry the week before. He didn't tell me that he was raised under Henry's ministry. Um, so it's like, Okay, so, okay, God, this is, okay, I believe you. I'm supposed to do this. Now, in the meantime, my wife had given birth to our daughter, Rebecca. And so I say, okay, God, I'm going to pull a second Gideon on you. Now you got to make the do the, the fleece dry. And it's one of those prayers, you know, you're very skeptical, and, and skeptical slash scared to pray. And so I prayed it. Now, when you, this is back in 2001. Now, there was no Amazon at that point, because that's the cheapest spot my kids tell me to buy diapers is Amazon. The cheapest spot to buy, di buy diapers is Walmart. You guys have Walmart here? Just long ago. Whatever your big box, if you have a big box store that has everything under the sun, the cheapest spot, whatever that is. Well, okay, that was the cheapest spot to buy diapers. So I'm buying diapers. Who do I start bumping into? No, not Jeff. Jeff's wife, Laura. <laughs> For the next four times, I go to Walmart to buy diapers. I run into Laura every time. The last time I did that, I didn't even say hi to her because I was afraid I was going to get arrested for stalking her. <laughs> okay, God, I got it. I got it. Now, I shared with my, I told about my wife, Erin, she was like, I'm having a baby. Uh, you know, she's going, okay, they gotta, they gotta have a job description. They gotta have a budget for you. They gotta have everything. And so I said, okay, let's go meet with Jeff and Laura. So we go meet with Jeff and Laura and Erin's walking to the parking lot. And it's not that Erin's heart was hard. She was just fearful. And Erin walks in and goes, we're just going to convince them this is what they have to do if they want you to join us. And, we come out of that meeting, that dinner. We're walking through. I don't say a thing. And Aaron's walking beside me, and she goes, who am I? Who am I? Who are we to ask God for what we want when he clearly has called us to do this? God instantly changed my wife's heart on this one. That's about the only time he ever spoke to me before my wife. That's the only time. <laughs> but he knew what my wife needed in that moment. And that was part of my 
affirming I'm supposed to. It made no sense for me to do this. I was raised in a Reformed tradition. God was calling me to this Baptist tradition. It wasn't for theological purposes that I was going to this Baptist tradition, but I knew God clearly called Aaron and I to this Baptist tradition to the point if we were disobeying, I would say, don't stand beside me because I'm going to be struck by lightning here because I know I'm disobeying God in this. Now, part of that story is I had to raise my own funds for this. Guess what God did next? For the next three years, I didn't ask one person, not one, for a dime, for my salary. People just came up and said, heard what you're doing. Here's a check. Heard what you and Aaron are doing. Here's a check. Not one. I feel so guilty when I say this in front of church planners. <laughs> I really do. But that's what God did for Aaron and I in our story. He will give you what you need. If you are sent out, he will give you what you need. In this story, Gideon needed the spirit of the Lord upon him. God gave Aaron and I affirmation after affirmation after after affirmation. And then when we said yes, he continued the affirmation. And that story lives on with my children. Now it's time for to tell it to my grandchildren. Because you need to honor God when he works in your life in the smallest and the biggest things. You need to tell the story of God in your lives to your children and your children's children. And he gives you the privilege to your children's children's children. Never stop telling the story. So in chapter 7, Gideon, God selects Gideon's army. Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the troops were with him, got up early and camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them, below the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many troops for me to hand the Midianites over to them, or else Israel might elevate themselves over me and say, My own strength saved me. Now announce to the troops, Whoever is fearful and trembling may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 of the troops turned back, but 10,000 remained. That's one-third left standing. One-third. Then the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many troops. Take them down to the water, and I'll test them for you, for you there. If I say to you, this one can go with you, he can go. But if I say about anyone, this cannot go with you, he cannot go. So he brought the troops down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, separate everyone who laps water with his tongue like a dog. Do the same with everyone who kneels to drink. The number of those who laughed with their hands to their mouths was 300 men. And all the rest of the troops knelt to drink water. That's a ratio of 1%. Started with 32,000 soldiers. God whittled it down to 300. 1%. You think Gideon was, Woo, let's go take him on. I don't think so. But God knew Gideon. In verse 9, we see, That night the Lord said to him, Get up and attack the camp, for I have handed it over to you. But the Lord said to Gideon, But if you are afraid to attack the camp, go down with Pura, your servant. Listen to what they say, then you'll be encouraged to attack the camp. So he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the troops who were in the camp. God knew Gideon needed another thing to assure him. 32,300. That's crazy. But God gave Gideon what he needed. So in verse 12, Now the Midianites, Amalekites, and all the Quidamites had settled down the valley like a swarm of locusts, and their camels were as measurable as the sand on the seashore. Immeasurable as sand on the seashore. Try and count some sand next time you're at the beach. Good luck. When Gideon arrived, there was a man telling his friend about a dream. He said, listen, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread came tumbling down, come, came tumbling into the Midianite camp, struck a tent, and it fell. The loaf turned the tent upside down so that it collapsed. His friend answered, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has handed the entire Midianite camp over to him. That's got to be God. 
a dream and someone to interpret that for him, for Gideon to be sitting there and listening to that. So verse 15, when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed and worshipped. He returned to Israel's camp and said, Get up, for the Lord has handed the Midianite camp over to you. Which leads us to principle number three. Number one was God uses the weak to accomplish his will. Number two, God will give his people what they need to carry out his will. Number three, God gives him, gives us the freedom to follow him. He gave Gideon the freedom to follow him. And Gideon chose to obey him. Watch me, he said to them, verse 17. And do what I say when he was talking to his leaders. When I come out of the outpost of the camp, do as I do. When I and everyone with me blow your trumpets, you are also to blow your trumpets all around the camp. Then you will say, for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him went to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch after the sentries had been stationed. They blew their trumpets, broke the pitchers that were in their hands. The three companies blew their trumpets and shattered their pitchers. They held their torches in their left hands, their trumpets in their right hands, and shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each Israelite took his position around the camp, all 300 of them, and the entire Midian army began to run, and they cried out as they fled. When Gideon's men blew their 300 trumpets, the Lord caused the men and the whole army to turn on each other with their swords. They fled to Acacia House in the direction of Zerah, as far as the board of Abel and Maloah, near Tabith. Then the men of Israel called from Naphtali, Asher and Manasseh, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon didn't even have to pull a sword out. Defies everything in military strategy. Everything. But God used Gideon to do that. God said, Gideon, I'll give you this. I will help you do this. Gave him the courage to do this. And God gave Gideon the opportunity to say yes or no. And he said yes. He went out. You know, Pastor Ron we talked about steps or something this, this uh, afternoon when he preached. I titled this sermon Steps. Rather interesting, I thought. And we take steps. And we, and we take steps. We have to take steps of faith. And... Psalm 119, I think it's 105, I think, verse 105. Yeah, it is. It's a very famous verse. We all probably know it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Now, we're in the 21st century, and we think of a lamp. Okay, maybe you pull your phone out, and you kind of point it that way, right? That's what we think of a lamp. We point it this way. Think about a lamp in those times. It was an oil lamp. Now, think about... When was the last time you were with your kids or your, whoever it might be, someone little, and they got lamps and you had pitch dark out? What do they do? Just for fun. It's like they take their lightning and shine right in your eyes. Can you see anything? Nope. Nothing at all. Blind as a bat. Completely. They had to carry the lamp down here. They couldn't see out the door. A powerful flashlight. I can see out the door there and I can see what's over in the parking lot there. I can probably shine one of the cars. Well, there's no one there. Okay, great. It's safe for me to go. The biblical example we have here is I see maybe two or three steps. That's it. That's all I can see. Let me get to the top of the stairs. I may see that first step. I don't see all three steps beyond that. I don't know what's on there. But I have a choice to keep stepping in faith because of what God's given me or not. God uses the weak to accomplish his will. When I'm weak, when we're weak, what do we need to be doing? The obvious, sometimes we forget, and hopefully not, we don't forget until we're in crisis mode, but we need to start with prayer. Out of our prayers and petition to God, out of our relationship with God, out of the abundance of the overflow of our ministry, of our out of our relationship with God comes our ministry. Prayer is the foundation of our lives. We need to be praying in our weakness. He 
he gives us what, he, what we need. We saw in verse 34. He asks for your availability, not your ability. He wants you. You don't need to know why. You know, you don't need, you need to, sorry, you don't need to know how. You just need to know that God has a plan for you and that he will use you. He gives you the freedom to do this. How do you know what tomorrow looks like? I don't know. God does. What's God calling you to do? Is God calling you to be sent out? How do you discern that? He may be calling you. It's the Spirit of the Lord will speak to you. The Spirit of the Lord will give you what you need. God will put you around brothers and sisters in Christ who can affirm that calling. God wants unity in his church, not disunity. He wants you to go together. He wants you to be sent out from a body of Christ. It's his church. He sends you out. You have a choice to obey or not. I have a choice to trust in God. I have a choice to seek his will. Will I or not? I don't know. But as you, in the quietness of your soul right now, you're thinking, maybe God's calling me up, calling me to do something I'm fearful of. Trust him. Look back in your life and see when God has spoken to you. I'll share tomorrow, another time on ministry, where God clearly, through scripture, a very similar story, something that just affirmed another step in my ministry. But everyone's story is different. The word of God is the, the foundation, the common thing there. And it speaks to us, it. a living word. But how God calls you, every one of us is different in that, and how that's affirmed. And if you're not sure, I encourage you to look back and you're like, how did he call you into a relationship with him? How did he call you, if you're a pastor already in ministry, how did he call you in ministry? Pray bold prayers. Don't be afraid to ask God, God, if you want me to do this, I mean, I'm joking, I'm just a dumb old white guy. I need a two by four, God, it's across the head to really whack me. You know, I, I, I'm not a great man of faith or anything. I'm, you know, it's okay to say, God, I'm afraid. It really is. Because when you say that, when you're open and honest with God, that moves your heart to availability. And he calls all of us to something. But what is it he's calling you to? You'll hear me say tomorrow, God is ascending God. What is he sending you to? Is he sending you to Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, or to the ends of the earth? And for everyone, those are all different spots. Your Jerusalem could be your neighbor next door. Your Jerusalem could be your father and mother who don't know Jesus. Your Judea could be, I don't know, Ghana, Uganda, I don't know, Ethiopia, the ends of the earth, maybe Canada, maybe the United States, maybe Europe. But I'm encouraged as I'm here and just watching God's church here. The zeal and the passion. For me, it's a glimpse into the future. It's a glimpse into heaven. But before we get to stand before our God and maker, we all have something to do for God's kingdom. Not ours, for God's kingdom. I encourage you, pray. Be available. Trust in him. And he will give you what you need for his glory. And never, ever steal the glory from God. 